Welcome to another edition of X's and Omar. We're calling this the Bye Week Friday edition. The Dolphins are back to 500, 2-2 two two on the season, heading into the bye week following a 38-14 thrashing over the Raiders in London. Miami rebounded from 19-point losses to the Bills and Chiefs to produce a blowout victory. We thought this might be a survivor game between the two coaches, and that's what it was. Dennis Allen voted off the island. Tony Sparano is back. <laughs> yes, he is back. Who ever thought he'd be a head coach again? I know. Well, and Joe Philbin gets to keep his spot as the Dolphins head coach. I'm WPC CBS 12's Matt Lincoln. He's the Sun Sentinel Dolphins columnist Omar Kelly. Hopefully, we're going to use this episode of X's and Omar to set you up for the final 12 games of the season. And if there's anything that we could tell from the first four games, try to figure out how the next 12 are going to go. What's interesting right now, Patriots, Bills, and the Dolphins are all 2-2 two and two heading into this week's games. Considering what has happened, right now are the Dolphins the best team in the AFC East. Uh, let's slow down a little bit. I know the Patriots. Who's better? Well, the Patriots are still have the elite quarterback. Obviously, okay. he's not playing like an elite quarterback. That's because the Patriots, as we said in episode one, <laughs> they didn't give him that many weapons. Right. He's got a suspect offensive line. The center of the offensive line is very soft. He's got no weapons. They don't have any power back because they got rid of LeGarrette Blunt. Um, you know, the Patriots have some issues. They are struggling. I think it's more of a GM issue, Bill okay. Belichick, the poor GM, as opposed to Bill Belichick, the poor head coach. But I, I have confidence that the Patriots will right the ship and figure out well, a way. You, see, you talk about the quarterback. You sound a little bit like a ball watcher here. I mean, in the, you, in, you in the trenches, there's no question the Dolphins are a better team, right? No, I we saw oh, we saw the Dolphins push around the Patriots. We cool. did, but that was in South Florida's heat and humidity. Okay, it'll be interesting to see what happens. A lot of a lot of players said that they felt like the monkey got on New England's back, especially in the second half of the game. Um, now, can I sit here and say that the Patriots are better in the trenches than the Dolphins? No. Can I say that the Dolphins are better than the Patriots in the trenches? I, I really can't say that. I think the Patriots should be playing better on a defensive mm -hmm. side. I really do think that they have had the talent for an elite defense. However, it hasn't been produced on the field. I expected their offense to struggle. I expected their tight end, Gronkowski, to play at 70%. I expected them to struggle with the running game. And they've struggled mm -hmm. probably a little bit more than I expected. Yeah, well, but, I, but hey, maybe the Chiefs are just that good. We don't know that. They certainly look good the last two weeks. And, of course, we were hitting the panic button after that loss to the Chiefs because we thought that there were a lot of mismatches there for the Dolphins, and we were wrong. So now yes. Dolphins maybe the are... the Chiefs are better than we think. Okay, so then my question is, are the Raiders just really, 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 really bad? Yes. Or, or can the Dolphins, what can the Dolphins take out of this you, one? You know what? I thought the Raiders were probably the worst NFL team that I've seen since I've probably covered the 1-15 in 15 Dolphins. I think they were are historically bad. Okay. Um, not just from a talent standpoint. They've got a 3-4 defense, 4-3 personnel. Um, you know, they, they the Dolphins did some things offensively, schematically, where they had the two tight ends out there throwing quick hitches to Mike Wallace, and the Patriots never defended it, never right. adjusted. And, and to me, that's poor coaching. And probably the reason why Dennis Allen is no longer the head coach there. I mean, it was just a horrible coaching job that even the most novice of football <laughs> observers can figure out. Hey, there are two tight ends blocking two cornerbacks with Mike Wallace free on the end. That's not a good idea. So, I, you know, the, I would say Oakland is probably the worst team in the NFL, if not probably one of the worst of the decade. And it wouldn't surprise me if they don't go, if they go winless. But I, I wow, think winless. Tony Sperano, he can sneak out two victories. Well, it can't be any worse than Dallas. Dennis Allen has been. Of course, the show is all about you. We incorporate your questions each and every week. Our first question comes from Eric Wolf at Eric Wolf three seven eight four. Who would like to know, does Joe Philbin have to be the guy to inspire the troops, or can he just be the strategist? I actually heard a uh, radio host in Miami two weeks ago talking about Joe Philbin. Well, if, if a laser's the guy here making the offensive calls, Joe Philbin's not the rah-rah guy. Okay. He's not the offensive strategist guy, because that's laser. Guy. He's not the defensive guy. He's, He's not, not the guy you motivate team. around. He's not the, who is he? What is he? What is he doing? What does he do for this Joe team? Joe Philbin creates game plans. Okay. And that's really where his strength is in terms of the strategy, the approach. Um, that's what he did in Green Bay. He's an organizational guy. I, I joke around and call him the librarian because <laughs> that's kind of his nature, um, you know, or the principal because he's, he's kind of a stickler for discipline and order and things of 
that nature. Um, he's the guy that creates the structure, creates the, the foundation, creates the game plan. Now, who's to say he's going to, he, can he not be raw rock? Can he not inspire men? Eh, I don't know. I'm not in that locker room. I, I have not heard players say that, yeah, Joe challenged us and Joe inspired us. You hear that a lot about a lot of coaches. Mm -hmm. Bill Lazor, last week it was uh, Kevin Coyle, who basically challenged the secondary, said, you guys are too good to not have any interceptions. You need to step it up. That's on you. Not, not anybody else on this team. You're not doing your part. And that really motivated them to produce the three interceptions mm -hmm. that they had. And four turnovers, because they also had a fumble recovered that was returned for a touchdown by Cortland Finnegan. Um, does Joe Philbin have to be rah-rah or to, to be inspirational or to be a, a you know, Tony Sperano type in your face to get a reaction from his teammates? I would say no, because if you look at Tony Dungy, they have similar personalities. Wouldn't we say that Tony Dungy was one of the better coaches of this era? I mean, I, I would say yes, but I, I think part of the problem is that Tony Dungy had a hands-on approach with the defense, whereas Joe Philbin doesn't really have a hands-on approach from an offensive standpoint. Well, and you hear that Tony Dungy's players, after they play for him, they talk about the love that they have for and the coach, the passion. Is that, is, that an easy, is that easy to say like that? Is that it? Or Because I don't really hear the Dolphins players talk about passion and love when they're talking about Joe Philbin. You know what? I think Joe has made a couple of missteps in his first season. Uh, I, you know, for going from your first season where you're just trying to understand the personnel, and then you go to year two where you clean out the locker room and especially clean out people with strong personalities. Then you learn from that. Right. Uh, you know, and the flip side is year three where you realize, hey, I got rid of all my leaders. I got rid of all the people with strong personalities. I can't win with a locker room full of choir boys. And then they go and add Cortland Finnegan, add Louis Delmas, add people with strong personalities to the locker room you know you, you learn as you go and that's part of part of the reason that the, the issue that I have with Joe Philbin is an issue I have with first-year head coaches I'm no longer a supporter of first-year head coaches <laughs> no longer believe in them I've had Cam Cameron had Tony Sperano had Joe Philbin and the correlation that you've discovered with first-year head coaches is they don't know what they don't know <laughs> right, right. And, and that becomes a problem so Right now, you want to get through the learning. You're going to get through the learning issues, and I think this is the year for Joe Philbin where he's discovered kind of what he doesn't know. You look at the quarterback situation mm -hmm. and how he handled it. Um, you know, it was a complete misstep. Right. A botched bomb <laughs> blew up in his face, yeah. and you know, he he decided that the best way to solve this problem was to say, "Okay, no longer am I ever going to talk <laughs> about depth charts Anyways, it, it, ever, it, again. ever ever again." <laughs> And that's not the right approach to take into the situation. What you should have said is you should have endorsed your quarterback and said he needs to play better. Right. And that was the message you wanted to get, get across to everybody in the South Florida and in your locker room and to Tannehill. You should have said it. Right. Instead of playing this game. Lesson learned. Well, we had an opportunity to see Tannehill produce his fifth game with a 100-plus passer rating. Oh, fifth and 35. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at least it happened, you know, and at least he looked Against good doing it. So what should we expect the rest of the season? The Tannehill that struggled against the Bills and Chiefs or the one that looked a lot better against the Raiders? I think what you can expect is a Ryan Tannehill that will remain inconsistent. Mm -hmm. He's been inconsistent throughout his entire career. He's been inconsistent throughout his college career. One game he's going to be good. One game he's going to be average. One game he's going to be bad. When you add them all up, it comes out to a average quarterback mm -hmm. it kind of, hopefully you know my goals from the beginning of the season I said this endlessly during the summer three goals for Ryan Tannehill I don't care what he does I don't care if he runs for 50 touchdowns I don't care if, if he throws for another 50 touchdowns I've got three goals for Ryan Tannehill nine wins mm -hmm. that means he produces the Dolphins first winning season in since 2008 a winning record 23 points, which in my estimation, doing the history of the teams during Joe Philbin era, the Dolphins are 6-1 and one when they score 23 points. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the number you got to get to allow this defense to play to their strengths, which is pin their ears back and go after the quarterback. Um, and, and, and then also, he's got to get to an 85 quarterback rating. That is the baseline. When you look at yearly, I look 10-year study, an 85 quarterback rating usually leads to a winning quarterback in the NFL. Whether it's he started, he only, like Matt Moore, he started, you know, 6-6, six and six, uh, and he had an 87 mm -hmm. quarterback rating. It is the baseline to a 500 season, and in order for you to get to a winning season, you got to at least get to the baseline. Let me ask you about something that I hear all the time. 
coaching staff needs to take their shackles off of Ryan Tannehill. They need no to let him, let him go. Let him throw. What? I mean, I would that's say just the, total. I would say the only shackle that I've ever really known that there was on Ryan Tannehill is they didn't want him running. And they probably okay. still don't want him running. Right. They're not comfortable with him running because if he gets hurt, like all these quarterbacks yeah, are right. getting hurt in the NFL, um, the fear is you, to unleash Matt Moore. I, I don't really know why there's this fear of unleashing right. Matt Moore, but then, you know, like the fear in 2011 when you unleashed him and you finally saw that he's probably a better quarterback than Chad Haney, it, they don't want to look stupid. Right. Um, so that that's usually where the fear exists. There's always fear about quarterbacks. There's always fear about quarterback controversy and quarterback debate and quarterback development and, you know, quarterback, how many stars as he have mm -hmm. listen to me a good quarterback should be making his team better and lifting up the talent level of the offensive line of the running back and of the wide receivers I would say right now the only unit that I personally believe that Ryan Tannehill is making better is the running backs right. because his play selection in terms of he looks but people don't understand is there aren't called runs and passes there are two plays that are called in 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 the huddle and Ryan Tannehill basically has to select which one based on what the defense is doing. And he's doing a great job in, in run pass. The Dolphins are averaging five yards a carry. They have the fifth best rushing attack in the NFL. So that's helping them. And it's Ryan Tannehill that's doing it, not just the backs or the offensive line. And I think the coaching staff's doing a good job of the one or two times a game of being able to exploit his speed and busting Moving. off for like an eight yard run. And it's happened a couple times where it catches the defense just perfectly. But when you start calling for yeah. five of those a game, that's when you get your quarterback nailed because they start watching for You it. know what? I think they need to move the pocket a little bit more, and they do on instances, but I think they do it too much for big plays. I think you just also need to do it for the intermediate mm -hmm. stuff. And, and certainly, I, I've always said he needs to run for a first down or two per game and just to keep defensive on, defenses honest and cheat a little. Right. And, and running quarterbacks, they do help you cheat right. a little. Only problem is it be, makes them susceptible to hits, and you don't want quarterbacks taking too mm -hmm. many hits. Mm -hmm. Earlier this week, you wrote a column about how Miami's lack of consistency as is the one thing that has been the most consistent thing during the Joe Philbin era, and man, have we seen that this year. How can the coaching staff and players fix this? Is this a coaching or player problem, this consistency thing? I think it's both. I mean, from an execution standpoint, execution is the issue, and, and that can't be on players all the time. I mean, you know, you look at the linebacker issues, uh, tackling, uh, they coach tackling, they work on tackling, so when you get to the game and you're not tackling, whose problem is right. it? Is that the coach's problem or is it your problem because you can't get your man down? Right. Um, so I think execution has to, has to work better. I think the coaches need to put their, some of their players in better positions to be successful. Um, I, I think certain players like Will Davis, he, you probably need to move him off the field. When you see a guy struggling, uh, you have to do a better job of, of sort of limiting those struggles and it, it'll benefit your team mm -hmm. in the long run. I think the use of certain players like Daniel Thomas and Jarvis Landry puts them in better situations and, and I think they're doing a better job of that. But you know, from a consistency standpoint, it, it, it has to be on the coaches because right. he sets the foundation, he lets the, sets the agenda, he set, sets the practice schedule, the, 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 the routines, the things that they work on in practice. Um, so everything starts at the top and it, it funnels down. So I think from a, you know, if you just look at this Dolphins team since 2012, consistency is the issue. Sometimes they look great, mm -hmm. sometimes they look bad. They play to the level of their opponent. Uh, you know, and that's not even just Joe Philbin thing. That's been the trend of this Dolphins team and organization for years. You know, they just don't, they play to the level of their opponent. So in this roller coaster season uh, so far, four games, mm -hmm. very inconsistent. What is, is there one thing that you have seen consistently, either good or bad, through four games? I like the running game. Yeah. I really like what I've seen from, from Lamar Miller, especially the past two games. Um, he's shown you flashes that he has starting back potential. Mm -hmm. I think he's on pace to rush for nearly 1,200 yards with just 13 carries right. a game, um, which to me is very impressive. And, and in fact, he still hasn't even broken a big run because right. Lamar is a big run producer. And yet, he, he you know, he's second in the league in 20-yard runs, but he still hasn't broken the big one. Right. And eventually that's coming, and you can see that it's coming. Um, from so, And I like the way the secondary has played in spurts, in spurts certain instances I think s some of the cornerbacks can play a little bit better I mentioned Will Davis a little bit earlier I I don't know where the Will Davis that I saw in the exhibition season went but he's disappeared mm -hmm. he's vanished in there <laughs> um, and, and then you know the safety play 
got it's got to get better and yeah. that's Lewis Delmas that's Jimmy Wilson and hopefully when Rashad Jones comes back he makes an improvement let's take another question this one comes from Jeff Jazuski 13 who wants to know if you were the head coach which player would you give more playing time to if I were the head coach um, certainly I would like to see more Christian King. I've always said I, I need to see more Christian King. Now, he wasn't available for a London trip, and he's been injured the week. Right. You know, he's been sick the week before, injured the week before. There's, all, there's always something. This week he had a death in the family last week, so mm -hmm. um, that's excusable. But I, I just think Chris McCain is a player where it, you feel his presence on the field, and you're just really talking about swapping out Phil, Philip Wheeler on some plays. Right. You know, most often fans. And I will say this about Philip Wheeler: <laughs> he's playing well. He's he's not as much of a liability as he was last year. Um, so I can't sit here and criticize his game. You can't look at a play and say, you know, except for maybe the first game of the season and say, oh, Philip Wheeler got killed on that. Right. Or, or you know, maybe uh, I think it was Buffalo where, you know, that that's besides the point. You, you know, you can't look at the team and say, oh, man, Philip Wheeler, he's such a liability. <laughs> um, but I, I would love to see, you know, um, uh, McC McC um, McCain. McCain, yeah. I would love to see McCain on the field pro providing more of a presence. And he was used in the speed package. Um, that's his role. It was Deion Jordan's role. Yeah. Um, and I would love to see him continue to be used in the speed package, even if Deion Jordan can, just comes back. Okay. Well, bye week comes this week. Really, during an NFL season, at any point, a bye week comes and it's a time to heal up. And certainly the Dolphins need it at this point. They might need it later, too, but at least they have it this week. Uh, Mike Pouncey, likely to be back for the Packers game. You've got Sean Moreno still uh, getting healthy. Shelly Smith, Billy Turner, Brandon Albert. Cole all Misi. They're yeah. all trying to get better. Misi, in particular, talked to him this week. Sounds like he's going to be healthy and back. I thought that last week, too. Well, that, that you know. he didn't play. Yeah. That, that extra week, though, adds that pad. And you know, you've seen that with a lot of coaches, too. They'll hold out guys the week before the bye just to be safe because they know there's that extra week You, there. you know what's so strange? I am, I've become obsessed about Koamisi. Just okay. from the standpoint, you watch it all exhibition. You watch it all training camp, even OTAs, him, him working as an inside linebacker. You watch it in the exhibition season, not a lot because small doses. Right. He had a shoulder injury, so they were holding him out for that, too. Then you watch him in game one, and you saw him on the first drive, and you're like, huh, he made three tackles. Okay, this yeah. might work. <laughs> and, he, and you know he's intelligent enough to be the director and conductor of that defense. And this is not saying anything negative about Jason Trez. Right. Um, he's been adequate in that job. But let's not pretend like that job does not belong to somebody else. Right. And that player is a four-year starter and has been an adequate NFL starter. Whether it's with the Dolphins, Colmese can go start with the Patriots. Colmese can go start with the Bills. Colmese is an adequate NFL starter. So and I'm you spent four months training him yeah. to get this body, You're not just throwing yeah, it's, Jason It's Fresnick not just like there. all of a sudden, oh, here, Colmese. <laughs> yeah, right. So I'm, I'm very excited to see that, especially now that you have a young guy like Jelani Jenkins who's blossoming yeah. in that position. If you have Colmese there identifying and saying, Jelani, look for this. This is coming, you know, directing traffic for him. It probably can help the entire unit play. So I would say um, Cole Misi is a guy I'm super excited to see play. Mm -hmm. Who would have ever thought I'd say that? <laughs> uh, here's another important guy that they're getting back, Rashad Jones. How excited are you to see coming off the suspension how he fits with this safety play that you say has been struggling? You know what? It depends on which Rashad Jones shows up. Are we talking about the 2012 Rashad mm -hmm. Jones or are we talking about 2013 Rashad Jones? The difference is, in 2012, the Dolphins built an entire defense and a scheme around Rashad's skill set, which allowed him to, a lot of times, freelance. Rashad had no responsibility. Right. He didn't have to cover any tight ends. He didn't have to cover any <laughs> scat backs. He didn't have to, you know, he, he didn't have to cover any zones. Rashad's uh, opportunity was just to go out there and make plays. Now, they're using Louis Delmas in a similar role. Mm -hmm. And what's going to happen when those guys come back is Lewis is going to swap and probably go to the free safety spot. I'm saying this is probably because the coaches are experimenting a lot with what's going on right now. When Rashad comes back, Rashad is not meant to be free safety. He takes too many risks to be the last line of defense. Now, Lewis has played free safety the most of his career. Right. He's probably more suited for strong safety, except he's a very small guy, so he doesn't have the build of a strong safety. But if you put Rashad at strong safety, Lewis at free safety, and then Jimmy Wilson at the nickel, you're 
strengthening what I would say right now is probably the strength of that Dolphins secondary, which is, I mean, st strength of the defense, which is their secondary. Jimmy Wilson is a very talented nickel cornerback. Talking to people in the league, they had him rated as the seventh to eighth best nickel in the NFL last year. Um, now you're putting him back to a position where he's closer to the line of scrimmage, where he's got more experiences. This is going to be his third year covering the slot receivers of the league, the Danny Amendolas, the Wes Welkers, and he's going to be allowed to blossom, continue to blossom in a contract year. And as I said, you know, it's not very popular. Jimmy makes plays. Jimmy has a history of making plays, and he got his first interception against Oakland. And that means that there's less Will Davis on the field. Yeah, he <laughs> will have struggled. I'm, I'm disappointed to see. I, I was super excited about Will Davis, but... He's struggling pretty bad. Yeah, he's a nice kid. I like talking yeah, to him. Yeah, he, he's you know, real fun to talk you know, to. Oh, well. But you got to play well, too. Okay. <laughs> At Lonnie Love wants to know, how big of a difference will Jones make on the Dolphins' D? We basically just answered that question. So let's move on. Do you, you have any more to add on the difference? You know what? If he comes back and he is instinctive, if they have linebackers that can now cover. Misi can cover. Jelani Jenkins can cover. Um, you know, and I think if you use that package and have those linebackers cover like they did in 2012, I think you might get back the, the Rashad mm. Jones that you knew back in 2012. Well, you know, and a lot of times this kind of suspension, you feel like you've been away from your team. You feel like you've let your team down. Absolutely. You come back with a little bit of a chip on your shoulder. And, and he's a guy where a chip on his shoulder helps him. You know, motivates him. Yeah, I think. I think, you know, he played well when he was trying to get that $30 million contract. Right. And once he got the $30 million <laughs> contract, maybe your foot came off the gas. Yeah. Now you've let your teammates down. It gives you a little added sense of motivation. Plus, you've seen that they got they got along just fine yeah. without you. Yeah, that's true. Uh, you know, so it, it's probably maybe a wake-up call. All right, now at 954, Italiano asks, says, with Pouncey coming back. That's we'll my Italian gambler, just so you is know. It, okay. uh, <laughs> so what happens with Samson Satelli? Samson Tatelli has never played guard because he's small for his position. And I personally believe he just becomes the utility backup. Now that Dallas Thomas is there, you want to continue to invest in Dallas Thomas as a starter. Samson Tatelli has been an eight-year veteran in this right. league. He's probably on his last leg. What is the point of continuing to invest in him as opposed to investing in Shelly Smith or Dallas Thomas? There's no upside to it. Now, if you see that Dallas Thomas is struggling mightily, then you say, okay, Samson, go ahead and you try the right you guard You got to win the game. You, you got to get by. But the upside is to continue to invest in Dallas right. Thomas, and maybe he develops and has some chemistry with Jawan James, you know, his former Tennessee teammate, and they, they can come become a, a potential Richmond Webb right. and, and Keith Sims. You know, that's that's a long way off, and, you know, that's a lot of, a lot of high maybe. praise. But you you have to continue to invest in the players who are your future and that's Dallas Thomas and Shelly Smith. All right, at Sean Fitz asks uh, Lamar Miller keeps the starting tailback job when Moreno gets back? Does it does he? He had the starting tailback job when Moreno was healthy. Does it matter? I mean honestly starting running back it seems like when Moreno comes back it doesn't we, matter. We you talked about Lamar Miller is getting 12, 13, 14. He could certainly continue to get that same amount of carries when Moreno comes back. Uh, to me, it's all about, one, who finishes the game. And the way yeah. the Dolphins use their backs is based on formations. Um, they go series, two series, and then two series, or they do formations. No, Sean Moreno's a third down back. Yeah. He's, that's what he does. And a lot of times, some of those third down packages, which are usually shotgun, the one back sets, as they call them, um, those feature no Sean, as opposed to Lamar Miller. So. Noshan is going to get his opportunities. I think where you're, where you're going to see the added value of Noshan Moreno is the power game. Right. Where, when they need to run a third and two. When you have to convert that third and two. Um, are, you, are you really confident, even though Lamar Miller's averaging you know, 5.7 yards per carry, that he's going to get that third and two running with power? Well, that's what makes him different. I mean, most third down running backs in the NFL are little guys who can catch the ball and move. Yes. Moreno is the one who not only can catch the ball, but he can also Run is the guy that, that is, the, is the power back. I mean, what's really shocked me, and this has just shocked the pants off me, okay. is how effectively they've been able to run the ball. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, you're talking a five-yard per carry, 
5.7 for, for Lamar Miller. And we're not even talking about runs that he just busted big right. runs. No, this is just 10, 10, 12. You know, Chris Perkins is not very happy right now. <laughs> uh, but he's consistently get, get grounding, grinding it out and getting first downs. Then you're talking about Sean Moreno. You saw the power that he had in the exhibition game against Dallas and the power that he brought against the New England game. Yeah, he only had one carry against the Bills, but you saw what type of back he was and the potential that he had to spark the offense and bring a powerful element to to this team. And that's what, they're too finesse. These yeah. Dolphins, for me, are way too <laughs> finesse. Okay. If I if I had to say anything about Joe Philbin to, to criticize him, one, it would be one, consistency, and two, his teams are way too finesse. Mm -hmm. No Sean brings that power, that dog, and that's what you need in order to, to be a good team, a 10-win team. Well, well, this problem didn't really manifest itself as much against the Raiders, but as well as the uh, Dolphins are running the ball, they're struggling a little bit to stop the run. How much of a problem do you see this is going forward? I said it wasn't a problem last year yeah. for most of last year. Yeah. Then teams ran for 1,998 rushing yards, which is too short of 2,000. Um, and it certainly was a problem. Um, what has me sort of confident is that they're only allowing 3.8 yards per carry. Now, that's yeah, pretty good, but it's they're stopping it for two, they're stopping it for three, they stopping it for one, but then the team, the opponent pops off a 20-yard run or a 25-yard run, and that's a little bit alarming and a little bit troubling and and very unsettling. I think also they they're struggling with quarterbacks who are running out of the backfield, mm -hmm. like you saw Alex Smith got them a couple of times. Um, they've got to tighten up on those issues. Uh, I'm not. I'm concerned about the run game without Randy Starks. Mm -hmm. Randy Starks sat out the London game. He's missed his first game in 111 starts, 111 games, um, because of a back issue. And he's a 30-year-old NFL veteran. Back issues just don't yeah, go away. Right. It's not all of a sudden, oh, I rested for two weeks mm -hmm. and my back is great. <laughs> um, usually, you know, they got to get a shot. And there, there are all kinds of issues that can come from back issues. Um, when you're a 330-pound man uh, carrying, you know, lifting heavy weights and, and, and playing 300, taking on two blocks of 300-pounders, it, it's, it's not going to get pretty. It's going to get worse before it gets better. All right. So five of the next game, eight games are on the road for the Dolphins. And obviously, they're playing for 12. 12 straight weeks. This is these well, first four games. Some Thursday night games. Well, these, Thursday night games. Right, and these first four games are supposed to be the easy stretch. So how <laughs> difficult now is this? I mean, are we going to know, are we going to find out who these Dolphins are in this next stretch of NFL five, games. six, seven games? Um, I think, you, you know, Joe Feldman has taught me this. Strange. Joe Feldman taught me this. Uh, you break the season down into quarters. Right. Um, there's the first four games, the second four games, third four games, and then the important I thought it was month. every game at a time. It was one uh, game at a time? Uh, it's it, not one it, game it, at a time. It's four it's, games at a time? Outside of the one game at a time, <laughs> okay. you break the season down into okay. quarters. And the first quarter, Dolphins were 2-2. Two and two. That was sort of my expectations for the team. Okay. Uh, second quarter, I also have an expectation of 2-2 two and two just because of the caliber of the opponents okay. that they're facing. I think the Chicago Bears, one of my favorite teams, good. are very talented, especially from an offensive standpoint. Did you watch the Packers last night? Uh, Packers are pretty good, too. Oh, yeah. Packers put up a gabillion points <laughs> on a bad Minnesota team. Now, that, that's besides the point with a horrible quarterback in Christian Ponder um, and no running, running mm -hmm. game. Um, but I think... Packers are going to be tremendously yeah. challenging. Uh, I looked at that game and I saw that their their, their receivers are going to challenge the secondary. Mm -hmm. Their their running back Eddie Lacy is going to challenge the Dolphins linebackers. Right. Um, they have a defense that I thought they were going to struggle on the interior, but they look like they've gotten it together and they found that next lane. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in that game. Dolphins have to consistently run the ball, and they got to hope that the heat and humidity gets to the Packers. Um, then you face the Chicago Bears. Then after that, you've got um, the J Jacksonville Jaguars, who, you know, eh, they're, should they're, be a win. Should, should be a win. win. Yeah, should be a win. I mean, if the Raiders are the worst team in the NFL, hey, the Jaguars are the second worst team in the NFL. You, you don't know about that young quarterback from UCF that has, you know, yeah, okay. probably in, in another two, three weeks, we're looking at a different quarterback. Um, but then again, teams are going to adjust to him and, and, and sort of understand where his game is. And probably by the time he gets to the Dolphins, they'll have a blueprint on how to, how to really contain him. Um, and, and then you got the San Diego Chargers. I like the San Diego Chargers game, and I think that that's the must win for the Dolphins from this standpoint. Chargers have no defense. Right. Um, and Phillip Rivers is, is a good quarterback, but 
you know, and they've got a good running game. But if you've got no defense, you should be able to score points, especially the fact that the game is in your own backyard. And the Dolphins have played well against the Chargers over the years. So to me, I think that second quarter of the season is a two and two. Where the season gets dicey to me is in, in no, late October, November. And I believe they've got a five of seven games on, on, on the road. And that's really where you're going to determine. I think the Dolphins have to win at least three of those road games. All right, let's take some quick hit questions, some rapid questions before we go on. Danny's, uh, Park, Danny S. Parker would like to know, what would be your two most important adjustments over the next two weeks? I, I would love to see them try to establish more of a power rushing game. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see them work out of the eye formation and not just be so finesse out of the shotgun all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to see them move Mike Wallace a little bit more. I know that he's asking for more than two. Right. I would love to see you know Chris McCain work in the blitz package and, and, and Rashad Jones get back to being um, the, the free-roaming Troy Palomalo-type safety and use, utilized like that. I think it plays to his strengths. I'm not a huge Rashad Jones fan, but I do know that he can be a playmaker. And I think you have to figure out a way to, earlier in the games, make more impactful plays so that in the fourth quarter you can have a lead. You can pin, allow the defense to pin their ears back and, and go get quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. Is Marcus Thigpen someone you want to see on the field more? Um... Not on the field as a offensive player. I think more, I'm a little bit unsettled about Jarvis Landry as a returner, and I've always been that way, even in the exhibition season. I just saw things that made me a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and I would rather be certain and secure and giving you very little than, ooh, sometimes I'm great, sometimes <laughs> I'm horrible. You know, and, and I just don't think you can afford turnovers. Now, he's a young guy. He's learning from his mm -hmm. mistakes. Hopefully you can, I would probably spend another two weeks continuing to invest in him, learning from his mistakes to, to see if he can handle that job without any help. Well, but I'm glad Marcus Thigpen is back and he's here. I mean, in my opinion, Landry has been a very good kickoff returner. Okay. And a Mediocre? Ver very bad punt returner. So, That's I mean, a fair you know, a yeah. very bad punt uh, Maybe not, not very, very good, bad. But I mean, there's been fumbles. There's been fair catches at the two. It's been very bad. It's, it's Okay. So, but the kickoff returning has been good. He's had these blown some big ones. He hasn't scored yet, so they, I guess we can't call they, him very good. They also good. signed LaMichael James from former 49ers cast off, and, mm -hmm. you know, he had a promising career at Oregon, but you got to be concerned about right. where he is, a talent standpoint, maturity. He's a, he's a bust, and, yeah. you know, who's trying to redeem his career with the Dolphins, and he's also a return option. It'll be interesting to see what they what they do with him and also how they u utilize Thigpen if they if they need him. All right. This, these are called rapid fire for a reason. All right. You know? Okay. Sorry okay. about that. Great. Uh, at Cortega24, true or false, read option should be used more. Yeah, it's used now. I mean, more, it, it, more. It's used now. Okay. I'm not, not, okay. not more. because so because you want a read option, you're gonna expose your quarterbacks to hits, and next thing you know, you got RG3 on your hands. No, thank you. Okay. <laughs> At Jordan Waldman one, is Earl Mitchell the best player falling under the radar for the Dolphins? Yeah, probably. I yeah. think he's been consistently good. Now I would love to see him play the run a little bit better than he has. Mm -hmm. Derek Shelby's made some plays too. Yeah. On that uh, line. Oh no, yeah. I would say Derek Shelby is probably, you know, probably very consistently. And I just wrote a story about him in the Sun Sentinel. He's so reliable and consistent. It's going to be hard for anybody, including Deion Jordan, to unseat him. I mean, think about the plays that Shelby's contributed. Yeah. So yeah, I, I withdraw. Okay, my, withdraw. My, so it's, Mitchell, uh, it's Shelby. Okay, it's good. Derek Shelby. Okay. Uh, We've asked that question a few times. Let's see. Um, Robert asks, how do the Dolphins effectively contain Aaron Rodgers? Keep him in the pocket. Yeah. Um, don't, be, don't be concerned about his cadence and his snap counts. Uh, that, that, I, I listened to that game on Monday, on Thursday night, and, oh, man, his language and his cadence, it was brilliant. And, you know, the communication, the line of scrimmage, and how he, he could throw you off with, with all, the, all the language and verbiage that he uses and, and, and fake snap count, it's amazing. But, yeah, keep him in the pocket, force him to throw, and I know people are going to say, you know, do you really want Aaron Rodgers throwing the ball? Yeah, you kind of want to make a team one-dimensional, force him into third and eights, third and sevens, stop the run, and force Force Aaron Rodgers to beat you. Okay. Uh, whoa. Uh, okay. Challenge. There's a challenge on the uh, plate. Okay. So, Omar, this is for you. Um, Challenger Wolf0933 from Twitter, he says, he follows you on Twitter. He says, you've always said 9-7 or everyone out. 
What happens if Dolphins makes the playoffs at 8-8 eight, eight, or even at 7-8? Uh, Hashtag X Omar. There's no way this any is NFL happen. team is going to make the I mean make the playoffs at 8-8. Eight and eight. Yeah, I, no, I, I no. just don't see it. I'm, I'm, I know the AFC isn't very good right now. Um, especially the AFC East. Oh, it's bad. AFC, it AFC East is garbage. Yeah. And if you if you can't put a reduced nine wins in a garbage division, I mean, it might be the worst division in, in the NFL right now. You have to get to nine wins in order to be a playoff contender. I, I just you might win you might win the AFC East with nine wins. Right. Based on I how the think you should. I think it's gonna I think that's gonna happen. All right. So before the season, you predicted the Dolphins would have a nine and seven record. You still see that possibility as a possibility right now. Oh yeah, I absolutely do. From this standpoint, I don't think that a lot of the opponents that they're facing outside of um, the Denver Broncos or you know are very are elite status. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like the you know, 49ers. I know they're, they've got their issues, or the Seattle Seahawks are, are on the schedule. I think every game that you play, except for maybe Denver, is probably a winnable situation, whether it's at home or at the, on the road. And realistically, you got to look at it from this standpoint: coaches are still playing for their jobs, um, and players are still playing for their status and, the, and, and their footing in the organization. So they still got a lot to play for. More than, I would say, a lot of organizations. What does Oakland have it's to play true. for? Oakland has nothing to play for. What does what Jacksonville have to play for? What does ja yeah, what that, Jacksonville have I mean, they're fighting. For? They're going to see what Bortles can do for them. I yeah, think that's what okay. they're fighting for. But they're still a they team have, that They're fighting have to see if they have a future, is basically. What's with, Tampa with, playing for? Well, apparently something, because uh, that was enough to beat the Steelers last week. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I really do think that the, the players have to figure out what their motivation is. And if your motivation, I, and I, I compare, I wrote a column comparing Tony Sperano's final season in 2011 to Joe Philbin's season this year, which could be his final sure, season. Sure, could be. And you got to figure out what your motivation is. This team has not played to their talent level right. all of Joe Philbin's tenure, all of his career. And you got to figure out whether you want to be that team that underachieves every single year or you want to find a new coaching staff that can actually maximize his talent. And that's what these players have to, have, to, have to identify. Do they want Joe Philbin and his staff to be their coaches? To me, it's a simple argument. And you have to get seven of the next 12 games. And that brings it full circle to what does Joe Philbin bring to this team? And is he the guy that guys rally around? Is he just a librarian? And will guys go to battle? for the librarian here over the last 12 games. All right, so that's been the bye week. X's and Omar, thank you so much for joining us. We're back to our regular schedule coming up next week, Wednesday at 12.15. You can find this show re-aired on sunsentinel.com later today in case you missed anything because we did go pretty long. Don't forget to check out the first and tens with rookie tight end Gator Hoskins and offensive lineman Darren College.